Wayne Clent here. What a month for Brum, eh? Eurovision, G8. Talking of which, if any of your girls was lucky enough to have Bill Clinton shower you with presents and splash out on a dress, give us a call. That's Wayne Clent, Forward FM 107.3. Now, after the G8, here's some news from J8, Junction 8. Yo, guessed it. So, for all of you who's stuck in that humdinger tailback, here's that great brummy band, The Modis, with Go Now. But don't. Not till the fella in front of you has. Since you gotta go, oh. Brum's roads offer the promise of escape. You can get anywhere, but Brummies don't want to. They've always stayed at home and made things. Birmingham's name is known everywhere, but its people aren't, and nor is their city, which is in the middle of England and is Middle England. It's hyperbolically typical of England, yet at the same time, it's hermetic. It's an ignored void at the heart of the country. Other places have a love-hate relationship with the car. With Brum, it's just love. It's autoeroticism without shame. This is Motown. The tendency of all English cities, save London, is towards centrifugality, towards outwards expansion, towards abandonment of the centre. The debased delusion of the rural idyll is to blame. The insistence on a two-up, three-down castle is to blame. The car is to blame. The city spreads inexorably, ever more dependent ever more dependent on the car, ever more accommodating towards it. It's not, it's not an accommodation it's bashful about. Brum is the city of the car. It was the epicenter of what used to be the British car industry and is now the Bavarian car industry. This is Longbridge, home of the Rover 500. It was on this very spot that the mythical car warrior Red Robbo exhorted his thousands of comrades to industrial inaction. Will all thy brothers in favour of resolutions 3 and 7 wouldn't be, please show? <coughs> Other than the car, there is no shorthand for Brum, no archetype. Liverpool has the Liver Building, and Scousers are all sentimental scallies who've got it into their heads that they're lovable. Newcastle has the Tyne Bridge, and Geordie's a hard mon, but with hearts of gold and T-shirts and sub-zero temperatures. <coughs> Yorkshiremen speak as they find, called blunt blunt, but Brummies? This line is called the Irony Curtain. It represents a sort of cultural divide. North of it, people mean what they say, say what they mean. They tend towards a boastful sort of local supremacism. The idea of a vernacular quotidian irony, of speaking against yourself, of saying the opposite of what you mean, is quite unknown north of the irony curtain. Birmingham is south of the irony curtain. The characteristic humour is that of self-deprecation. There's a little old Birmingham lorry driver Never been further than the People's Republic of Warsaw in his life. One day he's on long distance, and it's London. Never been to London, but he finds it. And he comes off the end of the M1, and he's driving down the Edgware Road, and he's had enough, and he pulls up on the double yellow lines, shouts to a bloke on the pavement. He says, hey, mate, is this London? And the bloke says, yeah. He says, well, where do you want this wood? Of course, Brum doesn't think the less of itself because of this idiom. It expresses its very essence, its very brumminess, by making light of itself, by conspiring to be the butt of a joke against itself. Irony's a code. It may disguise parochial pride, but it doesn't lessen it. 
I really, really love Birmingham. I love it to bits. It's the best city in the world. I could go anywhere, but I've got to come back to Birmingham. I've been to many, many places in the world, but there's no place like Birmingham. I think the city is a great place to live. Uh, it's a great place to be. Buildings are going up all the time. Brilliant atmosphere. I mean, if you go to the back of uh, Broad Street, oh, it's brilliant. It's really good. I love it here. I love it. People are great, like the people, very friendly. This is a city that engenders a loyalty that goes far beyond the long-distance sentimentality that Mancunians in St John's Wood and Yorkshiremen in Bray-on-Thames and Scousers in Kensington are so ready to boast of. Great place. Excellent. Very good. Excellent. Definitely. Brum uses its roads in a way that their designers can hardly have envisaged, not as trunk routes to London, Europe and the rest of the world, but as purely local amenities. A hundred years ago, this city with a short past and the apt motto of forward saw the future and realised that it had four wheels and an internal combustion engine. This was the first city to authorise one-way streets. It was the first city to build integrated garages. This one dates from the first decade of the century and it's seamlessly incorporated into the house in the way that a servant's room would be in the way that a stable wouldn't. Whoa! A horse was other, a car was a familiar. Outside Brum, it was only the very grandest country houses which had purpose-built garages. Houses such as Lutton's Marsh Court, which is now fittingly owned by the former chairman of Jaguar and current minister for offshore investments and labyrinthine trusts, Mr. Geoffrey Robinson. Mr. Robinson, who is, so to speak, overhoused, does not own a property in Brum. This is surprising given his taste for all things Italian. Brum is almost Italian. Its most famous interchange is named after Pasta. Its university tower might have been airlifted from Siena. And there are more miles of canal than in Venice. It was this that inspired Shakespeare, a local lad, to write The Merchant of Venice. The inky waters of Birmingham and Stratford, a towpath at dusk. Remember, tomorrow is Hags on Fags Day, so we're wanting to hear from someone who can beat Olive from Lower Gornal. She's the lovely old totter who's 70 years of age and has been on 70 a day since she was a gal, and she still loves her snake despite the emphysema. So, if you're 80 and on 80 a day and can stop coughing long enough to get to the phone, Give us a bell, Grandma. There's a month three six once we've seen your birth certificate. Now, here's that great brummy band, ALO, with Birmingham Blues. The cult of the regional accent has passed Birmingham by. In national broadcasting, for instance, it's commonplace to hear Irish, Scottish, Yorkshire or Welsh accents. Yet Brummy is never heard outside Brum. It's not heard because its owners know that it's despised, which is crass. Brum led England in the provision of education for all. Nonetheless, the city of ELO is the last where ELO cution lessons remain a middle class norm. Screaming queen sees bleating sheep steal green beans. No, 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 no winding milk. The screaming queen says bleating sheep steal green beans. Said. The screaming. Brummies speak with their feet and with their wheels. They don't allow either to take them too far, rarely further than Brum's home counties. To Kenilworth, if you're the doggy type, to Tanworth in Arden, Hampton in Arden, Henley in Arden, anywhere in Arden.
These are the villagers favoured by Brummie rock stars, many of them once managed by Don Arden. This is where Roy Wood lived and died. His hair, his moustache, his beard. Here's Robert Plant's house, Dun Zeppelin. And this is where Wayne Clent, former bassist with Vertical Horse and now Brum's most loved disc jockey lives. He just said no, to London that is, and to the rhododendron estates of Surrey. Brummy rockers stay put. Poor John Bonham, drummer of Led Zeppelin, has no choice but to stay put. Still, if you will drink 40 vodkas for lunch, you need a long nap after. These villagers are also home to the captains of what remains of British industry. They can lose meaningful minutes commuting between their almost country houses and the city centre. So what do they do to resolve this intractable problem? Do they call in the emergency services to clear their way? Well, they might, but the emergency services are otherwise occupied, fitting up suspects, busting libraries and coping with traffic accidents. 13% of Motown's population will have a traffic accident every year, compared with the national average of 6%. No. What the captains do is have Brum move to them, hence the out-of-town business park, 12 miles out. But how long will it be out of town? It is the rule of satellites that they create their own satellites. And so the captains will move on, and the business parks with them. This wasn't Birmingham, but it is now, because the sign says so. Good morning. Please go to the left or the right for registration. Good morning. Would you like to just take a badge and place it on, please? Meanwhile, the centre has been abandoned to visitors, to transient colleagues from all over the world, the non-anglophone don't notice the accent, nor are they likely to be apprised of the weary indifference that the city prompts in the English. They attend conferences and conventions. They're business tourists, men with name badges on their lapels and with wives who are hundreds or thousands of miles away and secretaries who aren't. Birmingham has already rebranded itself before the rest of Britain. Its new industry is talking rather than doing. There ain't no lynch in Congress here, Dwayne Lee. But we done got the wrong Birmingham. Ah, oh, shit. There is no profession, trade, or industry which misses an opportunity to convene. There is no firm whose staff have not enjoyed protracted exhortation and very real bonding somewhere in Brum. Let's push forward. Let's think positive. No, I'm sorry, mate. There's a. Uh... It's not relevant. I was probably at the registration desk and no, 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 but, but, but I've got I've got my ticket and I, I no, I'm sorry, you're not well. coming in. Those papers are not in. They are relevant. Look, you're not coming in. Remaining jobs works. Please go immediately. Central Brum is like a vast open-air airport lounge, a place that is passed through out of corporate necessity and commercial exigency rather than personal choice. Central Brum attempts to overcome its featurelessness with tokenistic works of symbolic intent. Anthony Gormley's Iron Man is a homage to a song of the same name by the Birmingham band Black Sabbath. Brum is the epicenter of heavy metal. And this thing called Forward succeeds better than it could possibly know in providing a metaphor for Brum. 
What I mean is that it's all vigor and no finesse. Brum is characterized by low aesthetics and high energy. When it goes beyond the utilitarian, it typically does so with a gleeful vulgarity and contempt for the canons of harmony, proportion, restraint, color, and so on. This can't have happened by chance. It's a sort of tradition, a genetic tick that passes from one hermetic generation to the next. So that whatever style happens to be the current fashion, it is deployed with a mix of steroid enhanced potency and coarseness. Birmingham's buildings have always flaunted the industrial nature of their components. There are other cities made of red brick. There are others where it is combined with mass-produced terracotta. But nowhere else are these materials a norm. The brick is positively choleric. Libraries, courts, schools, pubs are united in their apoplexy. The bad case of sunburn colour is inevitable because of the Triassic clays and Carboniferous shales from which the bricks are fired. They're so hard they won't weather or age. They're forever young and gauche, as though possessed of a dysfunctional pituitary gland. Even the arts and crafts, the most nostalgic of English idioms, was industrialised, which was, of course, apt in a city of machine production, a city unlikely to buy the William Morris line about the dignity of natural materials and the nobility of handcraft. Still, we shouldn't conclude from these remarkable hybrids that Brum has no taste for tweeners. This is, after all, the place where the ineffable Tolkien was born and where he grew up, if you can talk of such a man growing up. Middle Earth came out of Middle England, whose taste for saccharine cutesiness is indulged by Cadbury's. They built Bourneville as a counter to the city around it, importing ancient houses as large-scale ornaments and creating a chocolate factory which attempts to feel like a scholastic institution. Chocolate came from those crazy ancient Maya who would do anything to promote waking dreams and to bend their senses. I bet you didn't know that chocolate gets its colour from dead dogs. Tolkien's Gnomes on Acid and Trippy Whimsy are celebrated in Cadbury World, which seems to be trying to tell us that chocolate is a hallucinogen and that if you eat enough of it, you'll be looking at bubbling carpets and talking oranges and family pets mutating into buffaloes. band traffic jamming get it and now for all me mates in the west midlands regional crime squad all of them that is who aren't doing time at the minute here's that great broomy band the move with night of fear of the late 50s and early 60s was the centre's acknowledgement of what the suburbs already knew. 
that the car was king and that it needed ring roads. Inner rings, outer rings, rings ringing rings. These were the years of comprehensive redevelopment, of totalitarian remedies. Much of the architecture, almost 40 years on, has stood the test of time. But you cannot build Brasilia on the site of an extant city. And even had the city been rebuilt from scratch, the planning would still have been flawed. It is based on the presumption that the public shares the planner's ability to think in three dimensions, the ability to cope with shifts in level. Of course, in time, humans will adapt, but by then, all this will have been raised. The early 60s makeover also affected what is Brum's predominant land use, wasteland, car parks, car lots. And breaking news, there are two spaces in Works Road, multi-storey level five. Roads create both immediately adjacent wastelands and a hinterland of potential dereliction. So a ring road creates a ring of such potential dereliction. However, that potential has not been realized in Brum because the ring has been taken over by that 25% of the city's population, which is of Afro-Caribbean or Asian origin. These people have an aptitude for high density inner city living, which white Brummies have entirely lost. It may be an aptitude that they have had to acquire because they had little choice. Indigence and indigenous hostility saw to that. Brum is the city where the squalid old paranoiac Enoch Powell made the only speech that anyone's going to remember him for. And it was in the Smethwick constituency in 1964 that the charmer Peter Griffiths campaigned successfully with the slogan, if you want a nigger for a neighbour, vote Labour. The racially abused have taught their antagonists a lesson or two about civilization. It's the quality of cities, not of suburbs. Lessons about community, lessons about living in public, lessons about not hauling up the castle's drawbridge. These are the inheritors of Victorian Birmingham, the Birmingham which invented civic pride, the Birmingham that was characterised by a thousand trades, by vitality, hard work, self-help and a collective sense of community. Mystery sculptures in Victoria Square are an official acknowledgement of the new status accorded to the successors of Victoria's imperial subjects. The most evident architectural manifestations of Brum's demographic mix are, unsurprisingly and regrettably, religious mosques and temples. This mosque bears the name of and was endowed by the former Birmingham resident and British Leyland convener, Saddam Hussein. These building types are bizarrely appropriate in predominantly Victorian areas. Confident, unself-conscious about their propagation of irrationality, unashamed of their anachronism, abundantly and coarsely ornamented. This is the gustatory expression of subcontinental Brum, the Karahi. A demeaning nickname for it in a couple of Kashmiri villages was Balti, a bucket. 
that nickname traveled to Brum, where it came to signify a style of cooking peculiar to the city. There's more Balti in Brum than there ever was in Kashmir. It is truly made in Birmingham, specifically in Sparkbrook, my Lord Hattersley's former constituency. And look, Roy's been in. Balti has now spread way beyond Brum, but it still possesses strong regional connections. Its ingredients are grown here. Others are caught here. During Yasser Arafat's Birmingham years as a student of halal butchery, he moonlighted in an early lineup of the Electric Light Orchestra. He left, citing musical and beard differences, and was set to join Wizard when his cello was stolen. Still, the experience was not lost on him. Just as the Electric Light Orchestra adopted the acronym ELO and went on to worldwide success, so did Yasser's new group adopt the acronym PLO. And they too scored a few hits as well as occasionally bombing. <laughs> Will an anagram of an acronym achieve the same? This is L-E-O, pronounced Leo. Living gods, fantastical acts, metal sex clothes, men with wings and hands all over the place, superhuman feats of fellatio. That's Hinduism for you. And it's also heavy metal. Leo is the first band to acknowledge and exploit the commonality of the two religions' myth systems. But Hindu influence on the city is not restricted to temples and Leo. Anyone who has seen the erotic carvings at the Temple of the Sun at Kanarak in Orissa, or those at the Bamana Temple at Kajrao, will immediately make the link between them and the lap dancing at the Paradise Club, which clearly celebrates moksha, the congress of the human with the divine. The Paradise is run not by the god Shiva, but by an earthly deity, Benny from Crossroads. So you've got to stay, you've got to. Here, I, I couldn't stand it here without you. Please, don't leave me, please. No, I haven't seen Adam. No, he left here just after you did. Well, This was Brum's one and only telly soap. It was a celebration of the car, of car travel, of car parking, of the hospitality industry, of the titular motel in particular, and of motels in general. It is in the very image of Meg, and of poor Sandy, and of David Hunter's immaculate coiffure, that this city has rebranded itself. Thus does life imitate art. Every straight in this city holds a memory for me. Every underpass, too. It was a year ago today that Colin died. He was a lovely fella. He loved his football, and he was second to none in his appreciation of Balti. I used to say to him that every time he ate one, he was doing his bit for race relations and world pace. I can't ever drive through a certain underpass without thinking about Colin. I won't tell you which one it is, because I don't want you making it a shrine and putting off other drivers with your bouquets. I remember that night. I've been telling Colin my philosophy, which, as you know, is you've got to get yourself a philosophy. I think he knew I was right, but he just slipped off his lade and ran straight out under an HJV. Oh, golly.